F.H. Bradley was one of the most significant and influential philosophers of the late 18 and early 1900s. And like many influential philosophers, his influence consists not in the fact that everyone took up and agreed with him, but rather because he set the agenda and many people disagreed with him. But showing that he was wrong became one of the principal features of early analytic philosophy. In particular, G.E. Moore and Bertrand Russell's were students of Bradley, and at first they agreed with their teacher. Bradley was concerned with what the fundamental makeup of reality was, and he argued in essence that we could not divide reality up into things with properties standing in relations without falsifying the nature of reality. Yes, thinking of reality as independent things like a chair and a phone and a water bottle and stars and trees standing in relations to one another is a helpful fiction. If I say the store is next to the river, that helps you identify where you need to go when you need to pick up some milk. But ultimately talking in that way falsifies reality at its most fundamental level. Bradley just simply argued, when you try to think through the implications of dividing reality up into things and properties and relations, it actually results in paradox, contradiction, and becomes unintelligible. So he says, all right, let's assume uh, there are things and properties. Now the question is, how can we make sense of a single thing being the uniting bearer of many different properties. So there's this old philosophical problem of the one and the many, and the thing is gonna be a one in the many because things have many properties. So how can we conceive of a one thing holding together a plurality of properties? He gives us several options and exhaustively argues that none of them will work. The first option is that the thing is identical with one of its properties. You might think a thing is identical with its most essential, own most property. The example he gives is of a sugar cube, and you might say that the essence of sugar is to be sweet, so sweetness is the property that uh, sugar is identical with. But that doesn't work. Privileging one property over another gives us only a partial view of the total thing, which always has many different properties, and it takes away important characteristics that go into the makeup of the thing as a whole. Besides, the whole question was how a one thing unites many properties, and if we just get rid of all the properties except one, we really haven't made any progress on what we were really after. Second option Bradley considers is that a thing is identical with the entire set of all of its property. But that, neither does that give us what we need. That gives us an aggregate of properties, but the question was how those many th properties are unified into one thing. If we just have a set of a bunch of properties, then we don't have the requisite unity. We've just gathered up a bunch of things like stacking a bunch of books on the table. What makes it one thing? We still don't know. The third option Bradley gives is that a thing is an underlying substance distinct from all of its properties. That has a kind of Lockean ring to it, but that doesn't make any sense either. We then have to think a thing is what it is, even in the absence of all of its properties, but that doesn't sound right at all. Sugar is not sugar unless it's sweet, unless it has a certain color and texture. Finally, the fourth option Bradley gives is that the thing is the manner in which the properties coexist. But that's not very informative either. After all, that's what we're trying to inquire into. What is the manner in which all of these properties coexist in the single thing? It just pushes the problem back. Then the question becomes, What's the nature of the relation between the various properties? So this just reiterates the problem at another level of description. So in this dialectical procedure, we've come to find that none of this has been sufficient. And ultimately what we need to understand is the relation between the properties of a thing. 
So we need to look into relation. Bradley's ultimate conclusion about relations, and this is very important. This is one of the very things that the analytic philosophers will reject. He's going to conclude that relations are unintelligible if we think of them as having any explanatory virtue at this fundamental metaphysical level. Again, at a, at a more superficial level, relations are perfectly explanatory. If you ask, why does it take longer to drive from LA to San Francisco than it does to drive from LA to San Diego, that can be explained by saying that San Francisco is further away, there's the relation, from LA. And that's all fine and dandy, but what is the ultimate nature of reality? At that level, relations do no explanatory work and we can't even make sense of them, according to Bradley. So what's his argument for this? So he's gonna say, any explanation involving a relation will require another relation and that's an infinite regress. We haven't really explained anything at all. Bradley finds several related but distinct infinite re regresses here. So the first infinite regress is the lowest stage of this dialectic. And what we're supposed to do here is imagine that relations depend on their terms to exist. What does that mean? Well, suppose that the table is larger than the chair. There's a relation between a table and a chair. Now that larger than relation can't exist unless the table and the chair exist, right? Um, if we want it, there, if there are, is no table and is no chair, then there's no relation between them. So the relation seems to have a dependence on its terms. But then Bradley thinks, wait a minute, the terms can't exist without the relations either. That is, a table can't exist unless it's bigger than some things and smaller than other things. So the minute something pops into existence, it's automatically related to everything else. So terms can't exist without the relations. Relations can't exist without the term. So each term in a relation both determines the relation and is determined by it. But then we have to say there's some part of the thing that is determined by the relation and another part of the thing that determines the relation. But then these two parts of the thing have to be related together. So we have to invoke yet another relation to explain the original relation we were trying to explain. That's an infinite regress. <laughs> Bradley ultimately settles on the idea that because we cannot divide reality up into these separate entities, all of reality must be one thing. The independent, the seemingly independent things within this one must not really be independent, but somehow part of the whole. And the relations between the things must ultimately be legible only as in the relief of the whole. That follows from his discussion of relations that we just looked at in the following way. This is called the doctrine of the reality of internal relations. So there's this, a distinction here between external relations and internal relations. If the books are on the table, here's a relation, the on relation, books on top of the table, a relation between books and table, those books might not have been on top of the table. We might have set those books underneath the table. On this way of thinking, the books would still be the books, whether they were on top or under the table. That means uh, the relation is between the books and the table is external to the nature of the books and the table. Again, move the books, they're still the same books, still the same table, different relation. On this view, relations are external. A thing can be what it is and change all of its relations to everything else, it's still the same thing. An internal relation, by contrast, is, is a relation such that 
A thing having that relation would not be what it is without that relation. Now, Bradley says, because of the unintelligibility of separate things standing in external relations, we have to think that all relations are internal. What that ultimately means is that every relation in which a thing stands to other things is part of that thing's very essence. So that the essence of each thing entails everything else. The nature and existence of each object is so dependent on the nature and existence of every other object that had anything lacked any single property or relation that it actually possesses, neither the universe itself nor any part of it would have existed. So, in some sense, this book, this chair here, could never have existed unless it was related in the way that it's actually related to everything else, including the distant stars and galaxies all the way out there. Change one relation in a kind of butterfly effect and you lose the integrity of the whole. Now this has important consequences for philosophical method. If that kind of monism is true, then the process of analyzing something into its constituent components and then seeing how those constituent components are related together always involves a kind of falsification. Again, it can be convenient, it can be pragmatic to do so, but it involves an abstraction from the real nature of the thing that ultimately falsifies its nature. The parts of the thing into which we might analyze it don't exist in any true or fundamental sense. If they did, then there'd be more than one thing. As a result, the whole process of analysis that will be the engine of analytic philosophy is somehow a falsifying thing. So the analytic philosophers will break from Bradley on this doctrine of the internality of relations.